<clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Special Ideas at Pomona event at Family Weekend. Ideas at Pomona brings families and alumni Pomona's best intellectual content, be it live, streaming, or on demand. You can learn more about our lifelong, lifelong learning programs at pomona.edu slash lifelong learning. It's wonderful to see so many of our students and their families together on campus, and we want to thank you all for joining us. <clears throat> I am Kevin Winter, Assistant Professor of Media Studies at Pomona College. This is my first year at Pomona, and I'm very happy to be back in California. I attended grad school at UC Berkeley, where I specialized in film, media, and critical theory. I moved to New York after graduating, <clears throat> sorry, in 2014 and immediately began plotting my return to the West Coast. Uh, after making brief stops at Colgate University and the University of Washington, I was elated at the opportunity to join the media studies faculty here at Pomona. In media studies, we examine the cultural, historical, and political significance of film and media. Uh, in an increasingly networked and technological society, where screens frequently mediate our engagement with others and the world around us, where images and information proliferate everywhere, and public opinion and perceptions are shaped now more than ever by sound and image, how they are used to report events or convey ideas, the value of teaching media literacy cannot be underestimated. One of the crucial dimensions to media literacy is cultivating and understanding um, uh, cultivating understanding and awareness of popular modes of storytelling in film and media, and how storytelling techniques continue to change as media technologies evolve, the modes of production expand, and new channels of distribution emerge. Today, we will be hearing from Aditya Sood, class of 97, executive producer of the hit films Deadpool, Deadpool 2, and Murder on the Orient Express. Aditya was also a producer of the Golden Globe winning and Oscar nominated 2015 film, The Martian, and he is an executive producer on the Netflix political thriller designated Survivor, which is currently shooting its third season. His next film, Death on the Nile, sequel to Murder on the Orient Express, is due out in 2020. Aditya graduated with a degree in politics, philosophy, and economics from Pomona, and he is currently serving as a member of our board of trustees. So we're going to first hear from Aditya, then I will join him on stage for some discussion. After that, time permitting, we will open up the conversation to the audience and take a few questions. So now, uh, if you will, please join me in welcoming Aditya Sood. Thank you so much, Kevin, and thank you all for coming. I have to admit that I was a little surprised when I was asked to give this speech here today. I looked it up and saw the last two uh, speakers were Michael J. Fox and Jason Alexander. Now, personally, I have never starred on an NBC sitcom, so I got a little worried that Pomona had made a mistake and they meant to invite Cal Penn or and maybe they got a little confused. But then I remembered, I'm an alum, so clearly they wanted me to come out here and say a few rousing words to the students about how wonderful the liberal arts are and how much better the dining halls are now than when I was a student. And maybe drop a few references of the number 47. But then I remembered that this is being held on Parents Weekend, and it struck me that I have really been summoned here to reassure you, the parents of current Pomona College students, that all the hard work has not been in vain, and that your lovely children can work hard and graduate and go on to a career in their chosen profession. So I want to put you at ease and promise that this talk will just be a litany of very responsible advice on how to make the most of your Pomona College education. So students, 
That is why I come here today to offer the most valuable advice I can ever give you. Never, ever pick a major. I mean it, never. Try to get through four years without doing it. I bet nobody ever has. You could be the first. It could be the greatest decision of your life. Now, I can see uh, the faculty giving me some very dirty looks. I think I, I feel Gabby backstage is furiously looking up uh, Cal Penn's number. So let me try to explain. Okay, here are the classes I took in my first two years at Pomona. Calculus, Latin, macroeconomics, Homer, possible futures, Greek tragedy, linguistics, perspectives in music, intro to American politics, major British authors, astronomy, social and political philosophy, microeconomics, business ethics, topics in film studies, and introduction to computer science. Do you see a pattern there? I don't. The only interesting thing I noticed is I took precisely one film class in those first two years. My philosophy as a student was just to take classes that sounded interesting and didn't start before 9 a.m. But then finally, at the end of my sophomore year, I realized I was required to pick a major. So I did the thing that I probably should have done during freshman orientation, and I sat down and I read the course catalog. I went through all the majors and found that by chance, the classes I had picked lined up most closely with PPE, politics, philosophy, and economics. Now, an admission, I didn't even know the PPE major existed in the first two years I was at Pomona. And in fact, after I became a PPE major, I didn't realize that all of the other PPE majors were all going to law school. I just took the classes because they sounded fun. So let me back up and tell you how I fell in love with movies and storytelling. It all began with a large box that my dad brought home one day in 1980. A state-of-the-art magic box, a wood-paneled Panasonic VCR, complete with a remote control, connected by a half-inch thick wire that almost reached the couch. We were the first family I knew that had one. Now, an aside to those of you in the audience too young to know what a VCR is, we used to print out giant chunks of Netflix onto plastic containers and then play them on big computers connected to televisions that couldn't run any other apps. My parents and I immigrated to the United States in 1976, and this newfangled technology was a miracle. It was the only way for my parents to see current Bollywood films without getting on a 27-hour plane journey to Bombay or New Delhi. But having that VCR in the house had a very unintended consequence. In 1983, my parents decided that I was finally old enough to see a movie that had come out a few years before just in time for its sequel that was coming out in a few weeks. That movie, of course, was Star Wars. Now, like most seven-year-old boys, seeing Star Wars for the first time was a pretty profound experience. The difference was none of my friends had a way of watching it on demand as many times as they wanted. And in the summer of 1983, it turned out I wanted to see it many, many, many times. I probably watched it twice a day, every day that summer, which means, conservatively, by the time fall rolled around, I had seen Star Wars over a hundred times. I was a little obsessed. Another interesting thing happened to me in the fall of 1983. We started to study Greek and Roman mythology in school. And one more thing happened in that fall. The local Seattle Indian community decided to put on a Diwali festival complete with a retelling of the great Hindu epic, the Ramayana, performed by a bunch of elementary school children. And let me just say, you have never really seen the Ramayana until you've seen it performed by an eight-year-old Aditya Sood. I started to notice something. The story of Star Wars was the story of rescuing a princess and defeating an evil tyrant in a gigantic battle. 
But the story of the Trojan War was also the story of rescuing a princess and defeating an evil tyrant in a gigantic battle. And the Ramayan was the same thing. All three of them were so similar, yet different. Now, a couple of years later, I discovered The Power of Myth by Joseph Campbell, the literature professor who had spent his life's work studying comparative mythology. I loved movies, but I also loved math. And I was fascinated to see that there was a type of mathematics at play here, a pattern that repeated itself in three of the most enduring and popular stories of all time. I fell deeper and deeper in love with movies, and after reading the one George Lucas biography that was in my high school library, I realized that there were people who actually did this for a living. I saw that Lucas had gone to USC film school, so I thought, well, that's probably what I should do as well. I applied to USC, but I never actually applied to the film school itself. Instead, I figured, oh, I'll just take a bunch of film classes when I show up there not realizing that's not how it works at all. Now, in fact, my wife, Becky Chasen, also a Pomona alum, who actually works in undergraduate admissions at USC, makes fun of me about this to this day. At the same time, my very wise college counselor recommended that I apply to Pomona. I protested, but they don't have a film program, and it's a small school, and it's not even really in LA. Just trust me, he said, and I did. I toured Pomona, and I immediately fell deeply in love. I made a promise to myself that I would figure out some way to get in the movie business. But first, I would take four years and learn something to actually make movies about. I broke into Hollywood because of the internet. Now, in 2019, that doesn't sound very interesting, but in 1993, I was lucky enough to live in Smiley Hall, the oldest standing dorm west of the Mississippi, and more importantly at the time, one of the only three dorms that had a hardwired internet connection. Okay, it's a particularly dorky story that involves an internet chat room and a Usenet group, Rec Arts SF Star Wars, and a possible case of mistaken identity, but I made a friend named Steve Asbell who had led a strangely parallel life in New Jersey and was as keen as breaking into Hollywood as I was. He had spent the summer working at a then independent film studio called New Line Cinema and arranged for me to get an interview. I landed an internship that was supposed to last eight weeks, but instead turned into two years. In my senior year, I landed an internship at DreamWorks, which at the time was a brand new studio started by Steven Spielberg. After graduation, I went to work for Mark Johnson, a legendary producer who had made films like Rain Man and Good Morning Vietnam. I was an assistant, eager to prove myself, reading dozens and dozens of scripts every week and selecting the very, very best ones to give to my bosses. Technology served me well again. I had instant messaging before any of these other people did, so I would sit at my desk and overhear my bosses talking about some project at the studio. I would IM my friend who worked at the studio who would look up the information and IM me back. And then I would just casually saunter into my boss's office and said, oh, you mean such and such a project? I hear they're going to Tom Cruise on that one. My bosses looked at me in disbelief. They magically thought I knew everything. I got promoted from being an assistant in a little over four months. After Mark Johnson, I went to Warner Brothers and served as a studio executive there. And after six years, I went back to DreamWorks and ran another production company. I kept going and going and going. And then suddenly, I was burnt out. Somehow, in my mad rush that had begun when I was 18, I had lost my connection with what I loved to do. It was getting too frustrating to make movies, or more accurately, not to make them. I needed a break. At that time, there was a writer strike that was looming in Hollywood. Now, ever since Pomona, my other love had always been politics. And I got very, very excited about this up-and-coming young senator running for president named Barack Obama. So I did something I never imagined I would do. I left the film business and took a left turn into campaign politics. I found that campaign work was very similar to producing. You manage logistics, you're convincing people to do things all the time, 
and you have a very, very clear release date, election day. I found myself in charge of a small team in Los Angeles that helped to build the infrastructure for the campaign during the election. We recruited thousands and thousands of volunteers and sent them to swing states and organized outreach all over California. In a nice bit of convergence with Hollywood on election weekend, we rented massive sound stages in Los Angeles and housed the largest phone bank in the country, providing air cover for the campaign's get out the vote effort. After the election, I flirted with the idea of making a permanent career change. I spoke to a couple other campaigns and then realized that this had been a singular moment in history, certainly for me, and it would never be the same again. I may have proven to be correct about that. So I took a year off and did what maybe I should have done when I was 22. I traveled, I wrote, I took classes. I wanted to reconnect with the creative energy that I had when I was younger. But what I really wanted to do was recreate that period of exploration that I had at Pomona. And through that process, I realized that I had more that I wanted to accomplish in the film business. It was right then when I met Simon Kinberg, who was in the process of setting up a production company called Genre Films. We bonded over the fact that we loved the same movies, shared the same touchstones and ambitions. That was almost nine years ago. And since then, we've had a wonderful journey making over a dozen films and several TV shows. One of the critical things for us has been to force ourselves to restrict how many projects we get involved in, to only pursue the things that we truly love. They haven't all worked, but when they have, it has been immensely gratifying. The high point for me was finding a self-published book on Amazon that was written by a computer programmer in Silicon Valley called The Martian. At that time, the book had not been published by Random House. It was just a 99 cent download that Andy Weir had put up himself. I could instantly recognize that Andy was a writer who knew his science. In fact, far more than I did, but I knew enough to know that he was authentic. And the most surprising thing, especially for science fiction, was that he was really, really funny. As I read the book, I had a feeling that making this movie would be something that would change my life forever. By the way, I gave the book to my friend, Steve, now an executive vice president at 20th Century Fox, the very same friend I had made on the internet in Smiley 20 years earlier. The Martian was unlike any experience I ever had making a film. People kept saying yes. First, Drew Goddard, the only screenwriter who I, said, I sent the book to, said yes. Then, Matt Damon, the only actor we sent the script to, said yes. And then, Ridley Scott, who miraculously had a movie fall apart at the very moment we needed a director, read the script and said yes, too. Less than two and a half years after finding the book, The Martian was out in theaters. Now, throughout my career, my job has been to find new projects to turn into movies and TV shows. So I want to share with you a little about what I look for as a producer. But first, I want to talk a little bit about how audiences understand story. Cognitive scientists theorize that human beings are capable of only processing about seven pieces of information at a time. That's why phone numbers, for instance, used to be only seven digits long. By the way, phone numbers, for those of you too young to know, are an archaic string of digits that humans used to connect with each other and describe their Instagram stories before Instagram was invented. <laughs> but the way humans understand more complex ideas is through pattern recognition. If you're a brand new chess player, it can be overwhelming to keep all 32 pieces straight. But a chess grandmaster groups collections of pieces in larger and larger chunks based on their history of playing the game. So they are able to manipulate that same seven objects in ways that are far more complex than a beginning player. A similar thing happens in movies. Even if you are not a professional filmmaker, you are a professional story consumer. You have spent thousands upon thousands of hours watching and understanding movies since you were an infant. Every time you watch a movie, you add to that body of knowledge. You are also comparing what you are seeing to the model that you've created based on all of the stories you've seen before. 
Maybe this is the reason why mythologies are so similar across time and cultures, even if some of the details are different. When a movie feels predictable, it's because what you're seeing, even with brand new actors, at locations and stories, mirror the model that is already in your head. As our models get more sophisticated, we generally group different types of films into genres, like science fiction or westerns or horror. Each of these genres has its own particular set of rules. The movies in each category re resemble each other much more than they do films of other genres. So you, the audience, have an automatic list, list of expectations when you go to see a movie in a particular genre. So for example, if I asked you to list everything you could possibly expect to see in a romantic comedy, you might say things like, the meet cute, the first dance, they fall in love, the breakup, the romantic rival, the sassy best friend, the sassy best friend sets the main character straight, and the sassy best friend takes off her glasses and everyone realizes she's beautiful. So here's the first element I look for in a movie. I look for a story that has a clear genre and then changes precisely one of those conventions. The meet cute is the scene where the, first, where the main characters meet for the first time. Generally happens about 10 minutes or so into a movie. But what if you had a movie where that scene happened at the end? Well, you'd have Sleepless in Seattle. What if the romantic lead turned out to actually just be the sassy best friend? you'd have my best friend's wedding. And there are even deeper assumptions that we make when we tell stories. For instance, romantic comedies have two protagonists. But what if you had a bunch? You'd have Love Actually. Or all the scenes need to be told in order. Change that and you have 500 Days of Summer. This works in other genres too. For, take The Martian, for instance. It's essentially the story of a man stranded on, on an island. Now, we've all seen that a bunch of times before. Robinson Crusoe, Castaway, even Gilligan's Island. But the new thing here is Mars. And now here's what happens when you change one thing. All of a sudden, all of the other items on your list change their meaning too. In every survival story, the most important thing the hero needs is to find food. But what does it mean to get food on a lifeless planet? Human fertilized potatoes. In Let's Be Cops, we've all seen a million buddy cop movies, but what if you made a buddy cop movie where the two buddies weren't actually cops? Or Deadpool, it's a superhero movie, but a superhero movie where the protagonist is not actually heroic at all. It's similar to what you've seen, but different. Now, here's the second element I always look for in a movie, authenticity. The science of the Martian made that movie undeniably resonant, and even if you didn't understand all of it, undeniably real. The R-rated, breaking all the rules voice of Deadpool made for a movie that was true to the spirit of the groundbreaking comic, even if you had never read a comic book before in your life. Audiences can tell what is authentic and what isn't. By the way, the best definition I've ever heard about what makes for a great art is that it does one of two things. Either it reveals a truth we never knew, or more powerfully, the artist has noticed something about the universe that the viewer has also noticed and it echoes it back to them. One is similar, the other is different. Inclusion is not more important now than it has ever been, but it is more possible now than it has ever been. True inclusion allows for authenticity, and it can give you something old and something new. Let's talk about a different kind of new thing. Let's go deeper into some of what are the expectations the audience may unwittingly have when they go to the movies. Maybe one thing we've always assumed is that the protagonists in a romantic comedy have to be a man and a woman. But what if they're not? You have Love, Simon. We've all seen romances that are about a main character who are going against their parents' expectations of who he or she should marry. OK. But what happens when the protagonist is a hyper-rich scion from Singapore? You have crazy rich Asians. Or what if the 
protagonist is a Pakistani immigrant, the big sick, or superheroes that are from Wakanda and not Smallville, Black Panther, or Amazonian warriors, Wonder Woman. From a social good standpoint, inclusion is vital. But let's just be mercenary for a moment. Inclusion is just good business. The demographics of the country are changing. In Hollywood, that means the audience is changing. Authenticity matters, and that means the creators need to be changing as well. We are all unique, but we share a common experience. We are similar, but different. The superpower of movies is that they can make things larger than life. A human face on a 40-foot screen does something profoundly different than it does on even the biggest 4K HD TV you could have in your living room. Maybe the art form that comes closest is something like the Sistine Chapel, where the sheer magnitude of the work imbued it with the divinity that Michelangelo intended. And when that face is not a face that you are used to seeing, it can do something even more powerful. Like something else that happened in 1983 when a seven-year-old boy saw a movie at the Cinerama in Seattle and saw an Indian face played by Ben Kingsley in Richard Attenborough's Gandhi. It showed him that a different kind of hero could exist in a movie on a screen much bigger than one that could connect to a VCR. Kids don't have VCRs anymore, so now they need something even bigger that can inspire them. So why the liberal arts? The liberal arts to me is a process about thinking about thinking and about making unexpected connections. A high school teacher of mine once wrote an E.M. Forrester quote on a syllabus, only connect. I've come to realize that is what I do for a living. Throughout my whole life, I've just pursued things that I'm interested in with wild abandon and somehow have managed to find connections that have led me to an actual paying job doing things that I love. When I said don't pick a major, what I really meant was fall into a major. Follow your interests wherever they may lead you and trust those instincts. As you can see, all of those classes I took as a freshman and a sophomore popped up in ways I couldn't have ever expected. Politics, astronomy, and yes, even in Hollywood, business ethics. A liberal arts education was the perfect background for doing what I do every day. For me, this college was a hotbed of ideas and it was a hotbed of connections. And that is why Pomona College was the best film school I never went to. Thank you very much. anecdotes that I can um, entirely relate to. Uh, it wasn't Star Wars for me. Mm -hmm. uh, I spent um, an entire summer watching Do the Right Thing wow. um, over and over again. And it was, I, I want to say that something, I think that we had, my family and I had moved to a, uh, a new city. We were in a new home. And um, there wasn't a whole lot of emphasis on getting cable. Uh -huh. And so I had a copy, I had a VHS copy of yeah. Do the Right Thing. And I saw Do the Right Thing, I think, at least two or three times a day, every day. And um, so it's, it's refreshing to hear <laughs> that uh, you had a, a similar experience. It seems that anyone who has some sort of interest or investment in film has some kind of anecdote about being obsessed with one particular mm -hmm. movie and it having this kind of formative impact on them. Um, the first question I want to ask you um, returns us to your time at Pomona. And um, I think one of the concerns that oftentimes parents have when they are sending their kids off to college, um, thinking about the kinds of courses, you know, the child will call home and the parent <laughs> asks, well, so what are, you, what are you taking? And 
you know, you may hear something like, well, I'm taking a film class. And uh, it's like, you're doing what? Like, You've oh, never heard this. I, I've never, I've okay, never heard okay. this. No, I've never heard this. <laughs> and I, I have pre prepared responses for, 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 mm -hmm. for, for any such question. Um, but it's in your time at Pomona, when there's so much emphasis on thinking about the kinds of courses that you're taking, how that may actually, um, you know, carve out your path into a professional mm -hmm. career. Um, can you speak a little bit more about um, your time at Pomona and you know that wide array of classes that you ended up taking? How somehow all of these kinds of experiences still sort of led toward you entering the film industry? Well, look, I think it was a little bit different, maybe for some students, in that I think I knew what I wanted to do before I started at Pomona, and it just turned out that I didn't really change my mind about it. Um, so to me, taking those other courses always felt additive. It never mm -hmm. felt like, oh, I'm doing this in order to achieve some kind of result. And I think the advantage of that, in retrospect, was I could just, like I said, pursue things that I was interested in. Mm -hmm. um, I probably was not as, um, as risk averse as I should have been, <laughs> to be honest, <laughs> and looking back on it. But I don't know how I could have done it another way. I mean, I really, I, I, look, I found, and, and this is not a skill, this is the opposite of the skill, I found that I would do better in classes that I was interested in. I had a hard time, you know, getting into that gear right, for right. the things that you just had to kind of slog through. And mm -hmm. by the way, I think it's important to learn how to do that. Right, right, right. Um, but I don't know, it, 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 I felt like I, I had some intuitive sense that I would never have this opportunity again, that mm -hmm. there would never be a time where you could just explore and... Um, and experience things that you might not think to do otherwise. Right, right, right. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think that particularly in a period of time where um, an institution like Pomona College mm -hmm. and just like the liberal arts college experience itself is under threat from, um, you know, this sort of increasing kind of sense of having to neoliberalize the education of students so that mm -hmm. there's a quantifiable outcome for mm -hmm. what they're doing and what they're studying and how that translates into professional experience. I, I want to really um, latch on to that, mm -hmm. that point that um, the opportunity to just simply explore um, oftentimes doesn't really factor into that kind of outlook in terms of thinking about what an institution like Pomona College offers. Um, in thinking about um, the time from, I, I really loved your story about the uh, about the VCR, and you know, I, I, I would it would be funny to to hear how many people, how many parents out in the crowd actually still have VCRs. <laughs> that would be. So it's hidden somewhere in like a closet <laughs> somewhere. Um, I think they finally shut down the last factory that was still making VCR tapes, like only about like two or three years ago. Oh, really? But yeah, I think like there were still countries in um, in Asia and in Africa that were still uh, seeing new movies released on VHS, oh, really? believe it or not, until very recently. That that's absolutely <laughs> hilarious. That's really amazing. Um, in terms of thinking about. Um, you know, we, we touched on this when we were talking in the backstage briefly, but um, this like transition away from something like the VCR, like when you were mm -hmm. a kid watching Star Wars over and over again, having that physical tape, sticking that physical mm -hmm. tape into the VCR and watching it over and over again, um, transitioning to a period now where almost our engagement with, um, with media, mm -hmm. oftentimes in terms of the actual content itself is almost completely immaterial. Mm -hmm. Everything is sort of downloaded from whether it's streamed from Hulu or downloaded from iTunes or whatever the case may be. Um, in your discussion of storytelling, mm -hmm. how do you see storytelling changing um, mm -hmm. with the technological advancements that we see happening now, um, particularly in terms of delivery? Sure. Well, look, I think in a lot of ways, you know, th this transformation has been very disruptive, and, and there have been people and in companies and institutions that, you know, were very committed sort of to the old way of doing things that have been really undermined by these new, you know, mostly digital distribution systems. And at the same time, I think this has been a tremendously democ democratizing effect. Um, I think that it's... 
it's actually never been a better time to be a content creator or a filmmaker or whatever you want to call it because all of a sudden there are more ways for you to get your film, your TV show, you know, by the way, your music, your, your novel, look at Andy Weir, mm -hmm. you know, um, out to an audience than ever before. Um, and I think it has changed the, the kinds of stories that are being told. I think that, you know, one thing that's happened with studios, film studios, is, you know, in an effort to um, combat, I think, some of these threats, these existential threats, mm -hmm. um, they've, I don't want to say retreated, but they've, they've doubled down on the thing that they have you know, unilateral control over, which are, you know, franchise movies, which are, you know, things that nobody but, you know, Disney can make a Star Wars movie. Nobody but, you know, Paramount can make a Transformers movie. Mm -hmm. um, and now all of a sudden, if they have something that's popular, they, they really want to maximize those things. And I think that's come, unfortunately, at a little bit of a cost to what we used to call the movies in the middle, mm -hmm. that were, you know, just good stories with movie stars and, and, you know, unique ideas that had to be made at scale. They couldn't just be made independently. Right. Um, but I think you are now seeing some of those movies reemerging on these digital platforms, which is really exciting mm -hmm. because it's another way to get these movies made. Do you see in the, um, the grammar of mm -hmm. storytelling changing along with the way in which these technologies are mm -hmm. advancing? Um, you know, just in terms of just like, um, you know, because you talked about genre, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, one of the key elements of genre that you also noted was that um, genres are essentially um, organized around conventions. Mm -hmm. And one of those, uh, the functions of conventions is that when you go into a genre film that you have a set of expectations mm -hmm. and that when you see a film that those expectations could potentially be satisfied or frustrated, but those expectations are bound to certain kinds of a familiarity with form, mm -hmm. right? Um, so how is like the grammar of storytelling changing? Well, I think on a, on a very micro level, I don't know that it's changing that much, meaning how do you block a scene? How do you mm -hmm. shoot a scene? What are the, you know, your choices on a, on a very, you know, discrete fundamental level? I think those have kind of been the same since, you know, the 30s. Mm -hmm. um, I think what we're seeing, though, is, and you've seen this now, and really in the rise, I think, of television, and television that feels cinematic in, in so many ways, both in terms of the way, you know, the scope of the movie, you know, of the shows that are being made, like Game of Thrones, mm -hmm. um, or the content, you know, I, th I think broadcast television for so long was so, um, you know, so cordoned off from from approaching, you know, deeper, more adult stories because of the needs of, you know, advertising and things like that. But now with these platforms, um, you're seeing a real, you know, um, just unbelievable explosion in sophisticated adult storytelling. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's really interesting. And, and that's another way, stories that are, are being able to be told in a way that they never were before. Right. I think um, as very much as a, a function of this mm -hmm. change. And then you're seeing, you know, subtle things. I, I you know, it's funny. I'm, I watched my wife and I watched The Good Place um, over the uh, over the summer, which is just an unbelievably wonderful show. Um, but we didn't watch it when it was on NBC. We watched it on Netflix, and you know, these are just little 22 minute gems of uh, of comedy that are really wonderful when you string about six or eight of them together. <laughs> right. You know, we watched it probably in three or four nights. Right. And then it was a very funny experience for me um, going and watch, you know, coming into season three um, this fall. Mm -hmm. And I love sitcoms. I've been watching sitcoms my whole life, but not as much as I, I you know, broadcast television sitcom as, as, as I used to. And all of a sudden I found it really hard to watch this, to be fully engaged in the story in that mm -hmm. way, to watch, you know, six minutes of comedy and then, you know, two Procter & Gamble ads and then you come back and, mm -hmm. you know, um, and then you just see one story and, and you want the next little, right, you know. Right. And so I think that is really transforming um, how stories are not only being, I mean, uh, being consumed, but actually being told that if you are going to design a show now, you mm -hmm. want to design it for, you know, that kind of consumption. Um, yeah. 
which I think is actually really exciting. And there are things now that can be done that way that types of stories um, that I don't think you ever could have done. Right. In your role as a producer, mm -hmm. um, are you starting to, do you see yourself having to um, make decisions precisely around these issues, the issue of, um, you know, audience, audiences now are increasingly becoming accustomed to being able to watch an entire series mm -hmm. at one sitting. Mm -hmm. um, and many people don't really want to have to watch a show and then sit through the commercials or to wait a week for mm -hmm. the next episode. I, n I know even me personally and, and many of my friends that um, we I, c I can't watch a show. <laughs> like, like Take The Walking Dead, for example. Yeah. I can't watch an episode when it's, when it's on because I just, that, my experience with being able to just watch the show mm -hmm. all the way through without mm -hmm. the interruption, mm -hmm. that's now my go-to mode for experiencing mm -hmm. that content. Um, so when you're making decisions about the kind of content that you're going to you know, throw your mm -hmm. um, leverage behind, um, the kinds of stuff that you want to see get made, mm -hmm. is that factoring into the decision, how content gets delivered to people? I mean, look, well, you know, I guess the, the, the fundamental binary question is, is this a movie or is this a TV show? Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, in the old days, I think the way that we would think about those are, you know, movies are kind of complete stories and TV shows really lent themselves to arenas, mm -hmm. you know, a workplace, you know, the bar in Cheers, you know, you could make a hundred different episodes around those cast of characters. Mm -hmm. or, um, and then, you know, uh, over time, I think that's really started to change. Um, and certainly you look at The Sopranos, you look at Mad Men, you look at Walking Dead, you look at these, sh these shows that I think really, and I don't want to say because movies are better than TV, but in the, in the old way of thinking, mm -hmm. you know, I think felt more cinematic. Right. Um, and yet at the same time, I think there are things that, you know, you would say today would be TV shows, but actually would be better as movies. Mm -hmm. um, I was having this conversation with someone about the movie Dead Poet Society, which was right. a movie I loved when I was in high school and was exactly the perfect age um, when I saw it. And I, for re some reason, I'd just actually gone back and seen it for the first time in you know 30 years. And I remember thinking, gosh, this is exactly you know the kind of movie that could never get made today. Mm -hmm. And if you approached it, and I don't, I don't know if people have seen the the, the movie, but you know it takes place in a um, in a boarding school in the 50s, and it's about a bunch of kids who have an interaction with this very uh, iconoclastic um, and inspirational teacher. And then you know, not everything ends well for everyone. Sorry, spoiler <laughs> alert. It's been 30 years, guys. Um, <laughs> But if you did that today, you'd say, "Oh no, that's you know, that's a that's a TV show. You know, you do a show set in this you know very specific time and place." But I don't know that you would actually ever get the same impact that that movie had mm -hmm. for that particular story. I think what that story was about was a, a sort of a close-ended loop of this person coming into these kids' lives and then disappearing and changing their lives forever. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that that's necessarily what television is best at. I think that is something that movies are great at. And by the way, that goes back far before movies. I mean, that's what plays were great at. Right, and that's, right, right. There's a reason why I think just fundamentally we like experiences where we see a character go through a crucible and change or not change in about 90 minutes, you know, mm -hmm. right after we eat dinner. Like right. That's, that's a good yeah, way yeah, to, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, uh, using that, that, that as, a, as a launching point into um, a question that I think objectively is, is um, important, but mm -hmm. also subjectively I'm, I've long been curious about. Um, in terms of thinking about how we can develop characters who are compelling characters mm -hmm. um, that are going to, you know, touch uh, audiences um, like intergenerationally, mm -hmm. um, interculturally. Um, how has the superhero film hmm. managed to maintain such a strong hold <laughs> on the um, on blockbusters yeah. over the past? What, what are we at now, like two decades? <laughs> yeah, something like that. I mean, so I have a real theory about this. Um, I'm ready. Uh, yeah, here right. we go. I'm ready. All right. So I actually think that there have basically been three chapters of, 
you know, what I would call sort of alpha male hero stories in Hollywood. And the first chapter was probably the longest chapter. It was the Western. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting because the Western stopped getting made right around the time the next chapter emerged, which I think was the cop movie. Mm -hmm. And you look at Clint Eastwood, you know, it was the figure who clearly just yes. bridged those two yes. things, his two most iconic characters, right? And I think the cop movie actually stopped getting made almost exactly at the time that superheroes started getting made. And all of those movies, I think, are about different kinds of thematic issues that were going on in, in the country. And I think all of these are really American national myths. Mm. Um, not that you can't have those stories in other countries, but I think they are really fundamentally American stories. You know, one was about taming the wilderness. The next was about sort of, you know, conquering the city and making it safe for everyone. And, and then I think the, the superhero story has been something that's much more about, you know, defending from this kind of existential threat from without. By the way, if you look back, you know, if it's been about 20 years, you know, 9-11 was about 20 years ago. Mm. I think there's not a coincidence mm. that all of a sudden there was this, this desire to see, you know, larger than life characters that could just stop anything. Right. Um, even if it's not all just about 9-11. I, I think that entered the public consciousness in a way. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's a very powerful um, mythology. But what I think has happened in, in the genre is that it has gotten much more specialized. In fact, where I don't know that I would even call superheroes a genre, I actually think it's bigger than that. Mm -hmm. I think now you're seeing different types of genre stories being told within superheroes right. stories. Right. Um, and that's really interesting to me. And I think it'll, it allows us to keep that genre fresh and, and, and to, to tell different kinds of stories. And, you know, I, I think, I really actually think inclusion has been such an important part of that because, you know, I think there was a very specific type of, you know, of heroism that people had in mind that now I think has been expanded or is being expanded, I think, in really important and powerful ways. So do you, do you think then that um, when you talk about um, these things that are really important to you, genre, authenticity, inclusion, mm -hmm. um, in thinking about your future involvement with uh, superhero films, <laughs> um, and how I think you're absolutely right. I think that there, we, we're seeing um, these superhero films uh, begin to adapt. I mean, mm -hmm. there's really only so, uh, the types of superhero films that have been made, there, there comes a point where if you continue to do the same thing, mm -hmm. you're only gonna go so far. Sure. And what I find really remarkable is that precisely as, as you've described, they've begun to adapt. Mm -hmm. And you're starting to see these more specialized kind of genre stories being told mm -hmm. within the kind of parameters of the sort of, what is now the traditional kind of superhero film. Right. Um, so on the subject of genre and authenticity and mm -hmm. inclusion, um, do you see yourself continuing to remain involved in these kinds of like um, big budget films like a Deadpool? Um, do you potentially want to remain involved in these kinds of uh, works or are you interested in potentially pursuing um, different types of films that are not these kinds of big budget films? I, I, look, I, I love stories and I love, I love, you know, one kind of story that's really interesting to me is looking at these sort of bigger budgeted um, large scopes, you know, narratives and trying to figure out how to tell them in, it's big ideas in small packages. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you tell a science fiction story where you're just getting a glimpse of the world rather than committing yourself to spending hundreds of millions of dollars in CGI and, you know, and giant sets? Um, because I actually think that when you do that, you allow yourself to have more flexibility and less pressure, frankly, um, to take chances and to, to innovate mm -hmm. um, in these different genres. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I mean, listen, I, I love working on big movies, but I also am really interested in working on smaller movies. In fact, we just set up uh, about a year ago our first um, two projects at uh, Fox Searchlight, which is the art house division of mm -hmm. 20th Century Fox. And they're both movies that have really big ideas, but like I said, are being told in really kind of interesting, character-driven ways. So that's very exciting to me. Mm -hmm. um, what are you excited, and, and I don't know if this is, um, if you're even able to, to answer this <laughs> uh -oh. question without betraying um, <laughs> your, your allegiance to, to the uh, institution that you work for, but what are you really excited about um, that's happening in Hollywood um, mm -hmm. in terms of maybe, um, 
how you see a particular genre developing, maybe a couple of films that you know that are coming out on the horizon that you're really excited about. What's really exciting you um, in, uh, in terms of what you see on the horizon yeah. happening in Hollywood? I mean, look, I think uh, a lot of what, you know, and, and I think this has been true throughout Hollywood's history. I think, you know, there have been things that have been expected, mm -hmm. and then there's always something that's unexpected. And right now, I think we really are having a renaissance of filmmakers who are working inside and outside of the system, doing things that I think are incredibly innovative. So, um, you know, Last year, I got so excited about A Quiet Place, you know, which I, I'm, I'm not as much of an, a horror film aficionado as you are, but that was a movie that I really um, was, you know, gripped by on every conceivable level that I thought was just beautifully made, was such a unique idea, but was also um, such a metaphor for parenting. Maybe as a young parent myself, I, I'm not young. My child is young, let me just be clear. Uh, I, I, I found that incredibly powerful, you know, and I loved Eighth Grade, you know, which to me was like such a raw and honest look at that horrible period in everybody's right, life right. Um, that, you know, ultimately was so... Um, you know, I, I thought so honest and so true. Um, and so, like I said, I, I find that there are filmmakers who are just, you know, can, you know, Jordan Peele, I think, is someone who's like working inside the system but subverting the system at every turn. And that's right. really exciting. Um, that, that leads in precisely to, to the next question that I wanted to ask you. Um, there has one of the major developments that we've seen happening in Hollywood and in um, popular filmmaking in general, popular media making in general, has um, really been the rise of black voices in um, cinema and in media. Mm -hmm. um, I think of, um, of course, the work of Jordan Peele, mm -hmm. um, uh, Barry Jenkins, mm -hmm. um, obviously. I, I, I don't know how many people have actually seen Random Acts of Flyness, but uh, that HBO show, I believe it's the filmmakers, Terrence Nance, uh, remarkable, absolutely mm -hmm. remarkable, remarkable content. Um, how do you see from um, the business side of things? I mean, I think we can see how things are shifting in terms of aesthetics, and in terms yep. of visibility, the yep. optics of, I think, the emergence of new black voices yep. in popular Hollywood cinema. On the business side of things, mm -hmm. um, how is the, sh the landscape shifting in terms of thinking about, again, this, this really important point that you raised about inclusion? Yep. Um, we're seeing artists and we're seeing um, you know, Filmmakers, actors, writers, but on the business side of things, sure. do you see the landscape ch changing that way as well? Yeah, I think, you know, I think there were some really profoundly wrong headed myths that had existed uh, and do exist, but really had existed for a long time about, you know, oh, African American themed films don't play well internationally, and now that's what, you know, and, and consistently you, have, you are seeing that getting knocked down. You look at Black Panther, how, you know, there's, I think, outside of Avengers, the highest grossing right. uh, Marvel film, you know, to date. Um, and I think that, you know, finally there are also decision makers at all levels that are, you know, becoming empowered that I think have a, maybe a different worldview or maybe they've had now experience that have shown that, you know, we don't have to be so monolithic in the way that we approach. Um, making these movies mm -hmm. and who we make these movies with and for and and, and so um, I think it's all positive I think it is far from where it needs to be right. uh, and you know I think it's something where you know each success builds on the successes that come before. I mean, you know, one truism of Hollywood since you know the beginning was you know people love to chase you know everyone else's success. Right, so right. I actually think that these can become positive feedback loops. Mm -hmm. um, and and by the way, I think it extends beyond African American um, is, you know cinema. And I don't like to think of that as you know just a. a, a certainly not a genre, but certainly not just a thing that is, you know, separate from other um, films. But, you know, I, th I think you see in Asian American cinema, mm -hmm. you see um, with, uh, with Latin cinema, I, I think you see a lot of, of really positive um, changes that are, that are coming. And there's a heightened awareness, mm -hmm. I think. And then, you know, these things take time, unfortunately, but I think the really the, the key is there are questions that people are asking, there are conversations that people are having that I don't think they were having. Certainly, I didn't see them having 15 years ago, 10 years ago, even five years ago. Right, yeah, absolutely. Um, if I
let's pivot back to your um, uh, experience at um, at Pomona. Mm-hmm. So, if you had to really, you know, I, again, I'm really just so fascinated by your story about this, how you managed to, you know, sort of take calculus and, you know, you know, political economy and this kind of stuff, and then, you know, how that uh, translated into you really getting into the back lot and like getting your your hands dirty in terms of just like learning the film business from just like really just being in the film business. Um, what kinds of advice would you give to Pomona students who maybe have some thoughts about, I mean, that one feeling that we can all share um, uh, as uh, being an undergraduate student is, what do I do next? Right. You know, when I graduate, what do I, what do, I do now? I have, you know, yep. this, I have this degree. Uh, what do I do now? And well, so, what, yeah, so what advice would you give? So the one thing, I, and I say this to everybody who, who, you know, students who reach out to me or if I come to campus and talk to people, um, look, I think the one thing, you know, what happens after you graduate, you know, is a function of so many different factors. It's, there's a little bit of luck. There's a little bit of, you know, being prepared to seize that luck. Um, there's a little bit of, you know, the relationships that you're making and, 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 and all of those really important things. But I think the one thing, and I wish I had had this when I was at Pomona, was, you know, I thought I was the only person who was interested in film when mm. I was at Pomona. And it wasn't true. But I wish I had known the other people who were mm. also interested and figured out how to band together. You know, I think a lot of colleges do this really well. And it's not that Pomona doesn't. I just don't know that there's an awareness that there are that many people who are interested in media. Mm-hmm. And so the advice I, I give and I try to make connections when two people email me is I try to put them in touch with each other because Mm -hmm. the thing that is true and I I told in my story the people you meet at the beginning are hopefully the people that you're going to be growing with and 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 retiring with and complaining about young people with (laughs) someday Um, and and so really building that network early Mm -hmm. and with people who you know it's one thing to build it with you know people who have gone ahead of you in the in the business and can help pull you up but I think it's really equally if not even more important to to interface with the other people who are at the same right. position you are and to build that network yeah. and to forge those relationships yeah. and, and and I know we're, we're put, it's Pomona College but I would say it's across the, the five colleges yeah absolutely yeah. absolutely um, in so you've recently taken on a role as a member of the Board of Trustees mm-hmm. which is wonderful um, in your this new capacity that you find yourself in um, on the board of trustees, um, I, 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 you're having to now think about Pomona College in a rather different way mm-hmm. than you know from the big transition from choosing courses. What am I going to do after <laughs> these sorts of things? Um, in terms of, and I, I sort of touched on this in my first question. In terms of thinking about um, you know the experience. The quote, and I, I, I hesitate to use this word, but I use it. I'll use it anyways. Mm-hmm. The, the value of mm-hmm. the experience one gets at a liberal arts college, mm-hmm. in this new role mm-hmm. that you have on the board of trustees, how are you thinking about the importance of the experience that a liberal arts college can give its students? Well, look, I, I think the, the number one thing I think about is how to protect it. Um, and protect it, by the way, doesn't mean how to provide exactly the same experience that I had. And you know, I, I joke that I think there's not an alum anywhere of a school that doesn't lie awake at night worrying that there's a student not getting exactly the same uh, experience that they had when they were here. Um, so there's an evolution. I mean, you know, there's certainly the 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 kinds of resources that I think are available at Pomona now are incredible. And, and they, they were great before, but I, I just, I, I'm, I'm amazed to see what, um, not just, not, and, and not just in the physical research, I'm talking about the human capital, I'm talking right. about the professors, I'm talking about the students. I mean, you know, the work that's being done is outstanding. And um, I really think we have to think about sort of what are the fundamental values of a liberal arts education? and at this moment where it's not necessarily the most popular um, kind, it's not the most popular idea that's out in, in, in the world. I think a lot of people have questions about what the necessity of liberal arts education is. As we, you know, I believe in data. I think data is important, but we have to be careful what we measure because we will become that thing. Right. Um, I think there are a lot of different things that um, you get from an education at Pomona that right. really, like I said, need to be protected. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Um, I have one more question for you before we um, open up um, questions to the audience. Is Deadpool going to be in Avengers 4? Oh my gosh, I can't. I, I, I would have to kill all of them. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so let's uh, open up the the mic to the audience, and if anyone has any questions for Aditya, that would be that would be wonderful. Hi, thanks for your talk. Uh, I'm over here. My question is: Could you describe the process of financing a film? What are some of the challenges you face? Ah, uh, well, that's a that's a big uh, big topic. I mean, I think there are. So the, the part of my, the, the um, business I'm in um, is less about, I think, like the real specifics of, of um, motion picture finance, which is a very, very complicated um, and involved subject. Um, so the, the vast majority, I would say actually 98% of the things that I've done have been financed by one of the six, soon to be five, major studios. Um, and so basically what that means is the studio, for, for instance, in our case, the studio, 20th Century Fox, underwrites the uh, overhead for our company. They pay all the salaries. They give us nice office space. They um, make sure we have enough pencils and printer toner. And in exchange for that, our agreement is anytime we find a piece of material or you know, have a thought of something that could become a movie, um, we bring it to them first. Um, and then they have a right of first refusal uh, whether or not they want to develop it. And, you know, we've, I think, been very selective about the things that we've brought them. And for the most part, they've generally said yes to the things that we've, we've taken them. So, you know, for instance, The Martian, when I read that, you know, we were obligated to take it to 20th Century Fox, which turned out to be a great experience for everybody. Um, I think the question you're asking may pertain a little bit more to the independent financing world um, where you, you're making movies outside of the studio system. Um, it's, it's a world that I, you know, I know a little bit about. I'm not, you know, and I'm far from an expert on, but it, it requires, I think, a different kind of um, skill set and relationship set where you're, you know, doing everything from, you know, having a movie package which is a script and a director and stars and you know going to foreign finance or going to foreign distributors uh, and selling you know the rights to distribute that hypothetical movie in their country for a certain amount of money and then using that money you know to finance the production of your movie and you know and it gets far more complicated than that um, so I don't know if that completely answers. I mean it certainly doesn't completely <laughs> answer your question but you know the truth is there are a lot of different ways to get movies made uh, and financed and um, I think there are more actually every day especially as these new platforms that aren't sort of rooted in the, in the kind of old-fashioned models that the main major studios have been for the last, you know, 100 years. Hello, Aditya. Thank you. Hi, over Hi. here. I have no idea where you guys are. I can't, <laughs> I can't see you. See <laughs> so my question pertains to just the change in your enjoyment of films over the years. You said when you were really young, you watched Star Wars over and over again. <laughs> I'm wondering, since you broke out into producing, has your enjoyment of the film industry changed? Do you find yourself being so critical that you can't really enjoy movies as much? I'm curious about that. It's funny. We, we were actually talking about this backstage. Um, you know, look, I think you're always delighted by things that are truly delightful. I think, you know, I, I remember taking uh, a con constitutional law class here with Professor Flynn, and he had a great quote, which was, um, Laws are like sausages. Everyone likes them, but no one wants to see them get made. Um, and I think the same thing is true about the movies. <laughs> movies, you know, everyone loves them. You, you do learn a lot about, you know, all of the kind of innards of, of and, and decisions that get made. And you know, you try not to let that influence your um, your experience on, of seeing movies. But I think it's one of the reasons why. Um, you know, film festivals like Sundance and, um, you know, Venice and Toronto are, are so appealing to people in my business because they get to see a bunch of movies that they had never, ever heard of before. And they get to, like, reconnect with that experience, you know, I think of when they were a fan just going to the movies and, you know, hoping to have a good time. 
Um, so, you know, I, I think you become more critical for sure. And, you know, I'll, I'll get in debates with, with people about, like, why that movie that they love is not really that great of a movie. But, you know, um, but I, you know, what do I know? I, I, I have my, my, we all have our own personal opinions. Uh, but I think it is important to try to maintain that and, and that love. Um, it, it is easy, I think, in anything that we do, in any career, to get, you know, to get bogged down, to get used to, to for things to become old hat. So, you know, anytime you re you can rejuvenate that and, and reconnect to your love of film, I think is a great time. Yeah, as a counterpoint to that, um, the conversation that, that Aditya and, ha and I were having, um, I had a similar experience when I was first going to film school that um, I had so much invested pleasure in watching movies that uh, in my introduction to film class in my first year in undergrad, I hated it. And I, I was actually really, really kind of sad because I, was, I felt as if I had to make a choice. Do I not learn about how these films are actually, how they function, how they actually manipulate my feelings and my responses and my emotions to them by how genres work and how films work? Do I just remain completely ignorant and just enjoy the film? And, and one thing that you learn is that your enjoyment over time changes mm -hmm. and that it doesn't necessarily have to remain the same form of pleasure and enjoyment, but pleasure and enjoyment shifts with the object to which it is attached mm -hmm. over time. And that's a kind of natural experience. I'll also say one other thing. I think <laughs> we, we never actually remember this because our frame of reference is so, um, is so inherently biased. But um, have you ever gone back and watched a movie that you loved when you were about you know, seven or eight or nine years old um, and it doesn't quite hold up? It turns out that we all actually get more critical as we get older. Um, I think there was a great quote that the golden age of science fiction was age 12. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Uh, any other questions? Hi. Um, so I would imagine if you're an, for instance, economics professor, you would keep yourself up to date by reading recent papers. So my question is, uh, so you're a film executive, mm -hmm. and how do you keep yourself up to date? Um, <laughs> is watching Netflix every night part of your daily schedule? <laughs> are you talking, well, there are two parts of this question, and I'm very excited that you asked this, actually. Are you talking about creatively up to date or from like a business perspective up to date? Uh, I'm curious about both. Both, okay. Yeah. Well, the, the creative thing is, is easy. It's exactly what you said. It's just watch everything you can, read everything you can, you know, and I would, say creatively as important as keeping yourself up to date is actually going back and seeing the classic films and, and not so classic films um, and films that haven't held up and films that have uh, because I think the more you see the more context you have for understanding um, you know creative work in the future. On the business side um, this is a really interesting story so you know, one of the things that we were talking about um, was how the industry has changed over the last, you know, 20 or 25 years. Um, and I think there's been a real democratization of information. So when I was uh, in high school, I used to keep a list of all of the movies that were coming out that I wanted to see. Uh, and there used to be a magazine called Premier Magazine, which was published every month that would just have these great, you know, interviews with all of the stars of the movies that were coming out that month. But they had a little section at the beginning of the movie, of, of the magazine, about, you know, deals that were being made and projects that were going to come out someday. And I found that really interesting. And then one day, I was at the library in, in Seattle, uh, where I grew up, and I saw a, a newspaper. It was a magazine, but I guess technically it was a newspaper called Variety, which was the trade paper, still is the trade paper uh, of record uh, in Hollywood. Now, I didn't know what that was. I didn't know what that meant. I, I just thought it was like premier magazine on steroids because all it was was a you know it was 35 pages of you know deals that were being made you know the all of these projects that I'd never heard of and I dutifully used to write them down on my list and so you know by the time I was I went to work at New Line I had a list of you know 600 projects which I didn't realize were 600 projects that were in development um, I just thought they were movies that were going to be made someday and it turns out a lot of them never got made 
Um, now, back then, when if you wanted to know that stuff, you either had to subscribe. It was, there was the Hollywood Reporter and there was Variety. Um, maybe you could find one at your local library. But uh, I remember I found out that there was this other paper, the Hollywood Reporter, and I, um, I convinced my mom. I was a junior in high school. Uh, I convinced my mom that if I scored an 800 on my physics achievement test, she would get me a year subscription to The Hollywood Reporter, okay? Which, by the way, was $250, okay? And they would mail it to you. If you didn't live in Los Angeles, they would put it in the mail and you would get it like three days later. And so I ended up acing the test. My mom thought I was out of my mind, but she said the deal's a deal, and she got it. And uh, I, I would, you know, go to the mailbox, and I would dutifully, you know, pour through the trades. Um, and, and by the way, that continued when I was at Pomona. I, I used to get the Hollywood Reporter, you know, delivered to your dorm. Uh, delivered to the dorm. I would get it every day. I would read it. Um, and um, anyway, uh, the point of that is back then, that's what you had to do if you wanted to get that kind of information. Now the great thing is all of that's online. You know, you can go on the Hollywood Reporter website. Variety has a website. Deadline Hollywood is an, an, another one. Uh, the Wrap. Those are all sort of the industry papers that actually now don't even print physical copies anymore, which is too bad because I love them. And, and Variety in particular used to have a very specific style of writing um, very bad pun headlines. Mm -hmm. um, I think the most famous was, uh, and they had their, their own lingo, the most famous was Cricks, Nicks, Hicks, Picks, which meant critics didn't like movies for people in the countryside. Oh. <laughs> oh gosh. Um, okay. Um, I think we have time for two more questions. I see a hand. Somewhere in the front. Um, I have a question. Did you ever get a chance to go back to your high school and thank the guidance counselor who told you about <laughs> Pomona College? Uh, I did, and in fact, I uh, I saw he's retiring this year, um, and uh, you know I saw him at my reunion last year. And I was, I was, you know, he was, he was, trust me, it was a very, very popular teacher um, for, you know, it, it, certainly my experience could attest to that. And I went up to him and I said, and all of a sudden I realized, I said, uh, Tom, I, I, or sorry, Mr. Dolger, um, I, I, I can't tell you how much, you know, I, how much you changed your life. And then I, I realized, wait, I met my wife at Pomona. My child wouldn't have been born if you hadn't told me to come to Pomona. Um, hi, over here. Um, has there ever been a moment in your postgraduate career where you really saw like the value of your Pomona education shine through? That's an excellent yeah, uh, I mean, it, it, I'm trying to think if there's like one definitive moment. I mean. I actually find it's more of a day-to-day -day thing. I mean, so much of what I do as a producer is, you know, if I'm doing a movie about some topic I, I don't know anything about, you know, I'll go and get all the books on the subject or watch all the movies or, or you know, really try to become an expert. And I feel like I'm back at Pomona with that syllabus trying to get through, you know, a 13-week survey course. Um, so that at the end of that, you really can feel like you can talk about things intelligently. And that's what I really mean about, you know, the value of the liberal arts is learning how to think about thinking. It's not about the specifics necessarily that um, I learned at Pomona. The, those are, were great. Um, but it's really about the skills and the tools that I've been able to apply, I think, to a myriad of experiences. Aditya, thank you so much for taking time to speak with us. Thank you.